The roots of modern Western law are twofold. One, Roman law, and two, a series of revolutions. Much of modern Western law goes back to Roman law, and this is essentially where its secular and rational character stems from. Let me start by quoting Franz Wiecker, a world-renowned scholar of Roman law. The large amount of material which has been handed down to us and which we encompass in the term Roman law forms a constituent part of the Occidental world. It formed nations and legal systems. It provided the basis for the rational character of the systems and the legalism of the Western nations. Although they developed along different lines, the two great legal systems of the Western world have this rational character in common. I am referring, of course, to a well-known dualism. On the one hand, there are the legal systems of the European continent and of Latin America. These systems are essentially characterized by the great codifications. On the other hand, there is the common law of the Anglo-American countries. On the whole, this system is characterized by a unique court system and despite the growing importance of statute law, by the dominance of case law based on the principle of the binding force of precedence. But despite their fundamental differences, both versions of modern Western law go back to Roman law to quite a large extent. Viaco made these statements in an article on the importance of Roman law for Western civilization and Western legal thought. Well, you might think, no wonder that a scholar of Roman law is promoting the importance of Roman law. But Viaco is right. Until recently, Roman law was also a major part of the legal education at European universities, with a series of entire modules dedicated to its study. Obviously, I am not able to offer you anything like this in the framework of this course. But let me try to give you some insight, focusing on a number of core elements. Over its long history, ancient Rome developed from modest origins from a village into an empire. No wonder that over time there were major changes in its legal system as well. In its early stages, when it was still rather rural, Rome was governed by kings. But towards the end of the 6th century BC, the kings had grown so unpopular that the last king was thrown out of Rome and kingdom was replaced by a republican government system. The Latin word for king, rex, had become an insult for the centuries to come. Nobody wanted the kings back. During the almost 500 years of the Roman Republic, Rome grew from a tiny city-state into the dominant power of the entire Mediterranean area. In the first half of this period, Rome gradually extended its power over all of Italy, and in the second half it started to acquire provinces beyond continental Italy, namely Sicily, parts of Spain, parts of North Africa, and Greece, with huge impacts on society, the economy and politics, and also triggering the development of a highly sophisticated legal system. During its last decades, however, the Roman Republic went from crisis to crisis. The political system was not designed for a state on this scale. Its safeguards were no longer able to moderate the ambitions of powerful and immensely rich politicians and to ease the tensions between the elite and the masses. A series of revolts and civil wars broke out. In the last years of the Republic, Gaius Julius Caesar emerged as the leading figure in Roman politics. Many placed their hopes in him to save Rome from constant political turmoil. Thanks to his popularity, he succeeded in being elected dictator with a lifetime term of office thereby, however, leaving the framework of the republican system that allowed only for the election of a dictator in times of great danger as an exceptional measure to tackle a grave crisis, and this only for one single year. 
The lifetime election as a dictator earned Caesar the dangerous reputation of aspiring to become a king, a rex, which fatefully sparked a conspiracy of republican-minded senators. In the Senate session of the 15th of March 44 BC, which Caesar entered unsuspectingly, things turned dramatic. The conspiring senators suddenly surrounded him, pulled out their daggers and stabbed him to death. What followed were years of struggle for power and civil war, from which eventually, in 31 BC, Octavianus, the future Augustus, emerged victorious. Octavianus now held all power in his hands, but he was careful enough to restore the outward facade of the Republic and reject all monarchic titles, choosing instead the modest title of Princeps, the first citizen of Rome. In reality, however, he managed to control the state entirely using a combination of different special functions a system that was to continue under his successors, which initiated a new phase in Roman history, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that had been considerably expanded by Augustus and his successors also set the stage for the rapid spread of the new religion of Christianity. But the Christians were perceived as a threat by the imperial Roman state, which for two and a half centuries triggered a long series of cruel persecutions of Christians producing the many martyrs who are still present in the names of churches, cities and villages throughout Europe. Yet a turning point came with Emperor Constantine the Great. During his reign, the Milan Edict of Tolerance was issued, which henceforth permitted Christians to freely practice their religion. In the following decades, the relationship between Christianity and the imperial state grew closer and closer, and towards the end of the 4th century, Christianity was eventually declared state religion. This established a permanent association between Christian religion and Roman Roman emperorship that was to have a lasting impact throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. But the late 4th century also saw the definitive separation between the Western and the Eastern Roman Empires. In the following decades, the Western Roman Empire was to collapse in the turmoil of the migration of peoples although only to be revived later as a powerful idea that shaped medieval politics. In the East, however, the Roman Empire continued to exist for roughly another millennium, even though it was gradually pushed back by the Arabs and the Turks. Let me now turn to the periods in the evolution of Roman law. The first period is referred to as Early Roman Law. During this phase, Rome's territorial extension was still limited and its predominantly rural economy remained rather simple. And so did law. There was not yet any need for a more sophisticated legal system. But things began to change during the later Roman Republic that saw the emergence of pre-classical Roman law. In this period, a highly differentiated legal system began to unfold against the backdrop of an increasingly complex economy that developed in the vast Roman territories and involved a much wider range of different legal transactions. The foundations of most Roman law institutions were laid in this phase. The heyday of Roman law, classical Roman law, coincides with the first half of the Roman Empire that was also a time of economic development and prosperity. 
In this time, the greatest Roman jurists wrote their treatises and rendered their responsa, their legal opinions, on cases that were submitted to them. In their writings, legal reasoning acquired the crystal clarity and sharp conciseness we admire in Roman law. In the second half of the Roman Empire, economic circumstances grew more difficult, and along with the economy, the legal system began to decline. So what is special about Roman law? What are its characteristics? Well, in contrast to other legal traditions, Roman law of pre-classical, classical and post-classical times is not religious-based, it is secular. Furthermore, it offers rational, practical and highly differentiated legal rules. And finally, it developed into a uniform law for the entire Roman world and its multicultural population. The Roman Empire was home to a multitude of various peoples and many different religious communities. In that context, Roman law was able to provide a neutral legal framework. The religiously neutral character of Roman law also facilitated its adoption by Christian rulers and its influence on the canon law of the Church. Under the Christian emperors of the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, Roman law was the authoritative state law. The Byzantine emperor who became crucial for the legacy of Roman law was Justinian the Great. The central motto of Justinian's reign was to restore Roman greatness. He ruled from Constantinople, today's Istanbul. His original dominion was the Eastern Mediterranean. But then, as you can see on the map, he set out to conquer vast territories in the West as well and incorporate them into his empire with the objective of restoring Roman rule all around the Mediterranean. However, this was short-lived. The territories in the west were soon lost again to invading Germanic people, especially the Vandals. Another mark of greatness is the great church he built in Constantinople, the Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom that can still be admired in Istanbul. But his greatest achievement by far was what he achieved in the field of law. Justinian mandated a commission of legal experts to collect all the classical Roman law texts that were available and, based on these sources, create a compilation of the entire Roman law. The compilation that resulted from this work was given force of law in the whole empire. Today, it is still our main source of knowledge of Roman law. Most of what we know about Roman law, we know it from Justinian's compilation. This work has been a point of reference for centuries. Its impact and its significance for the whole development of Western law can hardly be overestimated. Later, the compilation came to be known as the Corpus Juris Civilis. There have been many editions of the Corpus Juris Civilis since the Middle Ages, for example this one. And you have here the four parts of the compilation, the institutions, the digest, the codex and the novella. The institutions have the character of a textbook as used in legal education. It's a perfect introduction. The main part is the digest that contains excerpts, essential passages taken from the writings of the most famous jurists from classical times. The whole thing arranged in a systematic manner. You can find here, for example, precise definitions of notions such as the obligation. You can find the requirements for a contract to be concluded or the legal consequences of an error that affects the conclusion of a contract. And you can find all the specific rules applying to issues arising from different types of contracts, such as rules on what the buyer can claim in case of non-conformity of the goods delivered by the seller. The Codex codifies the legislation issued by the emperors over more than 600 years. Finally, the novelle, which were added later, synthesized the legislation of Emperor Justinian himself. 
Justinian's compilation continued to form the basis of the applicable law in the Byzantine Empire, even though later on it was somewhat simplified through newer compilations aimed at summarizing its essence and making it more accessible. But in these simplified versions, the corpus remained in force until the end of the Byzantine Empire in 1453. In the West, however, Justinian's compilation disappeared. The text was lost for centuries. But then, in the 11th century, a manuscript of Justinian's compilation was rediscovered in the library of a monastery in Italy. In the picture, you can see the rediscovered manuscript, which later came to be known as the Litera Florentina. It is among the treasures kept in Florence. This manuscript is the basis for all later editions of the Digest. This rediscovery triggered the development of a whole new science. The rediscovered text was studied intensively by generations of scholars in northern Italy. The first group of such scholars are known as the Glossators because they wrote explanations of the texts of the Digest, which took the form of marginal glosses. The example in the picture shows the text of the Digest in the middle and the explanatory notes, the glosses, all around on the margins. Scholars of a later generation are referred to as the post-glossators or the commentators. They went a step further by writing commentaries that focus on the principles, on the rationale behind the rules of Roman law as exposed in the Digest. All these scholars taught at newly founded universities in northern Italy but their reputation soon extended far beyond. They attracted students from all over Europe, with the most famous center of studies being Bologna. The University of Bologna, with its celebrated law school, was an elite institution. However, as the picture illustrates, university teaching in those times was not so different from what it is today with a professor giving his lecture and students listening or not, some of them taking notes, others falling asleep or talking to each other. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's imagine that one of those students, maybe the one on the left-hand side who seems to be listening carefully, had come from afar and now, after some years of attending courses and engaging in debates, he successfully completes his studies in Bologna, having acquired deep knowledge of Roman law. And let's imagine that he now travels back to his home country somewhere north of the Alps in order to start working in legal practice. But what he now experiences must be rather frustrating. Practice is entirely different. What he has learned all those years in Bologna proves to be more or less useless in practice. Legal practice in the Middle Ages is dominated by local customary law. The Roman law, the learned law he has brought home from Bologna is just irrelevant, pure theory. Nobody is interested in that kind of things in legal practice. Maybe our poor student should better have used his time at university for a good sleep, like his colleague. But over time, things gradually changed in Europe. Step by step, Roman law found its way into legal practice. Educated jurists began to apply Roman law principles wherever they were faced with issues that were not addressed in local customary law. Roman law rules filled the gaps where local customs remained silent. Roman law principles also served as guidelines for the interpretation of local customary law rules. This led to a continuous Romanization of legal practice in continental Europe in a process that is referred to as the reception of Roman law. 
It was a long process that took centuries, but eventually it resulted in Roman law becoming the relevant law that applied in legal practice all over continental Europe. A uniform law had formed that was common to all of continental Europe, the so-called Jus Commune. However, this unity was lost again later due to the codification process set in motion by the increasingly powerful European nation-states in the late 18th and 19th centuries. National codifications led to a nationalization of the law. A prominent example is the codification of French law initiated by Napoleon at the beginning of the 19th century. This comprehensive codification comprises a civil code called Code Napoleon, a code of procedure, a commercial code, a criminal code and a penal code. But even though the national codes differ from each other, they are still full of Roman law concepts. Their common Roman law origin is still clearly recognizable. Roman law was also studied in England since the Middle Ages, and Roman-style legal reasoning with its rational and practical character has deeply marked English legal thinking. To see this, just think of the amount of Latin phrases used in legal English. Legal practice, however, developed in another direction in England than on the continent. The English legal system has its historical roots in the common practice of all royal courts. And this is where the term common law comes from. The basis for this was laid with the centralized system of justice put in place by the Norman kings following the conquest of the year 1066. Royal courts issued so-called writs that were standardized forms for different types of lawsuits. To commence a court action, the complainant had to ask the court to send a writ detailing the complaint to the wrongdoer, who therewith received a royal order to attend court hearings, where he had to answer for his behavior. Such standardized writs came to be used in the English system of royal justice on a regular basis, and by creating new writs, the royal courts in fact created new rights that became enforceable in court. This focus on the practice of the courts went hand in hand with the binding force of precedence. In common law systems, judges are bound to precedence. The principle is known as stare decisis, a Latin phrase literally meaning let the decision stand. Every new court decision in such a system adds to the huge body of case law accumulated over time, which can make legal research quite challenging. To help practitioners meet this challenge, legal scholars seek to make the vast case law accessible. The first very influential such effort are Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, published in four volumes between 1765 and 1770. Those volumes became required reading for generations of jurists in England and other common law countries. According to Lord Avonmore, it was William Blackstone who first gave to the law the air of a science. He found it a skeleton and clothed it with life, color and complexion. He embraced the cold statue and by his touch it grew into youth, health and beauty. Civil law and common law are two very different versions of modern Western law. But both owe much to Roman law. 